can you put my slides? Uh, good morning, everybody. And um, I must begin with uh, uh, thanking Shiva for this very kind introduction and for asking us uh, to come to Hyderabad. Uh, the whole format of uh, this program, Face the Examiners, have been synthesized by Sir Dr. Palajani and Shiva. And uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to see that we are in the seventh edition and we are going and we have now new colleagues who have joined. Uh, I'm seeing Srinivas and uh, many other colleagues and I'm seeing a lot of you here. Uh, what I'm going to uh, talk in the next 17 to 80 minutes is what essentially Sir talked. But as she was telling, there will be a little approach, little difference. What I'm going to talk is the art of history taking and clinical approach. Uh, to it's not advancing. So this will advance from. Okay. So let me begin with quoting Sir William Wassler. Sir William Wassler, you all must have known, is uh, one of the greats always in cardiology. Sir William Wassler told about the history taking, always listen to the patients. They might be telling you the diagnosis. And history taking goes beyond the examination. All throughout your life, when you will be approaching a patient, the first thing which you have to do is history taking. So the first message is always listen to the patient carefully. The art of history taking and clinical examination is dwindling all over the world. And there's a very nice editorial by Dr. Valentin Fuster about the future of uh, a stethoscope and the clinical examination, where he emphasizes that neither history taking has become obsolete nor auscultation has become obsolete. And these two arts cannot be replaced by modern technology. In fact, these two arts should go along with modern technology. There is a lot of evidence in the literature which tells that if you do a good history taking and a good physical examination, the diagnosis of heart failure, the diagnosis of valvular heart disease, and diagnosis of coronary artery disease can be made with a lot of accuracy. So this has been documented by several studies that these things are important and there is a good correlation. Now how to approach a patient, how to approach history taking? We should, we should always encourage the patient to give history, except in cases where the patient is a child where you should ask the mother or ask the close relative if the patient is too sick. It is extremely important to know the language of communication. And nowadays, we are going cross-country. You are going for your DMs to different states. And I will strongly suggest all of you, whosoever are in different states, to learn the local language. You can only obtain a good history if you know the local language. At least the language which is relevant to the case examination, patient examination. Patient gets a different type of confidence. He opens out, he is able to narrate himself better. And in case the language is a barrier, then should take the help of the interpreter. History should not be taken in a very hurried way or in a crowded order. There is a big room, 15 people are sitting and you are taking history. You will never be able to do a good job. At times, it becomes important to ask leading questions if you feel that the patient is going completely aware, which can happen sometimes. And you should interview the person who was with the patient if you are suspecting that there is a history of syncope or cyanotic spells. These two histories can be best made by interviewing uh, the accompanying person. The symptoms, it is important to know for the same disease of the same severity, symptoms may vary from patient to patient. So history is quite a lot, an expression of the individual and your ability, how much you are able to extract out of him. 
I already emphasized about the importance of the interpretation. Symptoms depend, will depend on whether you are dealing with a valvular disease, congenital disease, a rhythm disorder, or you are dealing with a coronary artery disease. Comorbidities, coexisting illnesses can modify the history. Should always obtain history in a systemic way, and I will be laying down how you should approach. You should take the present history, past history, history of the family. If you are suspecting a coronary artery disease, history of the risk factors, the treatment, the procedures. History should be precise. It should be informative. And you should take the history in a relevant way to make a good diagnosis. Accurate history depends on the way you approach and certainly on the patient's background. Now, there can be specific pointers. The moment you see the patient, you can get an idea. If you are dealing with a patient below the age of five years, most likely you are dealing with a congenital heart disease, either cyanotic or a cyanotic. If you see any extra cardiac features, as Dr. Palajani was telling, you look at, you have, you see features of Marfons or Nunans or Turners, you know what diagnosis you are going with. Below 30 years, majority of the times what you will be seeing will be congenital heart disease or valvular heart disease and some cases isolated cases of other disorders when you look at a patient above the age of 40 years there can be a variety of illnesses which can present at the age eight, which can be valvular congenital myocardial diseases hypertension now when we are approaching a history taking Primarily, there should be three aspects you have to keep in mind. There are certain symptoms which are called as primary cardiac symptoms. There are certain symptoms which are cardiac symptom, which are symptoms of cardiac illness, but they present with manifestations and other symptoms, and there can be symptoms related to complications, like infective endocarditis, arrhythmias, or CCF. Others can be, you have to take history to know what we are dealing with, whether patient has a rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, any hypertension, any drug history. Now, when we look at primary cardiac symptoms, and Sir already gave you idea about some of the symptoms, there are six primary cardiac symptoms. Dyspnea, chest discomfort, palpitations, edema, syncope, and cyanosis. Let's deal with them one by one. At times you will realize, and when you grow more and more in the field, that obtaining the history of dyspnea many times is extremely difficult. The expression of a given patient may be completely different from the second patient. What is dyspnea? It is abnormal, uncomfortable sensation of one's own breathing. And different patients will express it differently. Somebody will say that I get a catch in my breath. Other person will take there is a shortness on breath. Third person will say I have a labored breathing. And again here, what is the expression in the local language? That's how the patient will complain. Uh, the dyspnea is supposed to be due to activation of mechanical and chemoreceptors in lung, heart, and pulmonary arteries. And there can be multiple causes of dyspnea. A dyspnea can be due to heart disease, it can be due to lung disease, it can be due to severe anemia, it can be due to metabolic disorders, particularly acidosis, uremia, or it can be due to anxiety. So dyspnea doesn't mean that you are dealing with a cardiac disease, and that's how you have to take the history in a much specific and precise way. When you see dyspnea as a complaint, you have to know about the duration, what, what is the class, relieving factors, associated factors, character, whether it is exertional induced. And Sir did mention some of the types. It can be orthopnea, PND. There are other varieties like trapopnea, when you get breathless on lying on one side, seen in various lung disorders. You can have dyspnea, which is there on a standing, platypnea, orthodexia syndrome, and bendopnea. Now, PND and orthopnea, sir, did talk. Let me tell you, PND and orthopnea often coexist. 
The common cause of orthopnea also is a left heart failure, but it is important to know that orthopnea is dyspnea on lying down, which gets better when the patient sits up or you raise the upper part of the body. Orthopnea can occur in various disorders, commonness being left heart failure, but orthopnea can also occur with massive pleural effusions, can occur with pericardial effusion, can occur with massive ascites. So they should not be confused that they are synonyms. Ob obstructive sleep apnea can give rise to orthopnea. And many times in patients of heart failure, there can be a combination of central and obstructive dyspnea. Bendopnea, uh, sir did mention about the bendopnea. And this is a sign of advanced heart failure, not only of heart failure. And there is an excellent paper in JSCC heart failure where it has described the hemodynamics of these patients. These are the patients where there is a pre-existing high pulmonary wedge pressure and low cardiac output. And when they bend, there is mediation via the reflexes and the uh, pulmonary wedge pressure further increases. This, you are already aware, the New York Heart Association classification or American Heart Association classification. And this is for four symptoms, fatigue, palpitations, dyspnea, and angina. American Heart Association has modified the NYHA classification. In Canadian Heart Association classification, as Sir mentioned, is for angina. There are also other classifications, Goldman's functional class, six minutes walk test, which is more objective. So in the exam, you will be many times asked and you should be aware of that. Now, it's a, again, a common question asked, how do you differentiate that dyspnea is coming from the lungs or from the heart? And let me tell you, at times, it can be extremely difficult. But important to know that cardiac dyspnea is a specific scale. It will come at a specific scale, a specific speed. Like patient will tell you that when I'm climbing the bridge in Mumbai, it's very common for people to go catch the train. They will climb the bridge. They will become out of breath. And the moment they stop, it goes away. Uh, whereas the pulmonary dyspnea, it does not have this type of pattern. It is gradual. It can be seasonal. And of course, there can be acute increase in both acute decompensative heart failure in cardiac and uh, acute decompensation with bronchial asthma. Chest pain is another symptom, and again, I think meticular attention to quality, location, radiation, triggers is extremely important. Probability of disease entity in a given patient. Now, there can be different type of chest pains. The chest pain can be ischemic, what we call as angina. There can be chest pain, which can be aortic pain, and it is extremely, Dr. Palajani touched on it, Aortic pain is very classic of dissection and other aortic disorders. It is maximal at the onset, tearing mostly at the back, whereas the pain of myocardial infarction or pain of acute coronary syndromes is usually not maximal at the onset. It becomes maximal in next 10, 15 minutes. There can be pericardial pain, which increases with inspiration. Pleural pain increases with inspiration. And of course, other causes of pain like GI conditions, cholecystitis and all meticulous details about where the pain is and most of the times if you will ask the patient do you get pain in the chest patient will say no I don't get pain in the chest different patients may complain of pain at diff sorry that slide went off quickly so it can be retrosternal it can be epigastric it can be radiated to the arm there can be various permutation and combinations Acute coronary syndromes, uh, Dr. Palajan, you already touched, so I will miss it. Uh, palpitations is another cardiac symptom, and it is abnormal, uncomfortable awareness of one's heartbeat. Again, the expressions can be different. Somebody will say there is a fluttering in my heart. Somebody will say that is a skipping. Somebody will say pounding. Assess the history. What is the duration? What is the regularity? What is the rate on set? Are there any triggers? Those which are regular, rapid, pounding sensations in the neck usually suggest AV nodal re-entry. Sudden, fast, rapid, unrelated, lasting for a few minutes can be SVT. 
and palpitations which are exertional or palpitations which are there on lying down many times may be related to volume overloading palpitations on lying down sometimes is a manifestation of anxiety the anxiety also can give rise to palpitations syncope is another cardiac symptom which is an extremely important symptom to know and syncope is defined as transient loss of consciousness due to transient global reduction in cerebral blood flow, rapid onset, short duration, and there is a spontaneous recovery. You should know all the points to differentiate it from epilepsy. It is again quite commonly asked and because of the time I won't be able to touch that. So syncope and epilepsy differentiation is important. An abrupt cessation of cerebral blood flow for more than 10 seconds and blood pressure. So there are two elements in syncope. The cardiac output decreases, systemic vascular resistance decreases, and there is there can be sometimes an element of arrhythmia, bradyo or tachy. So we should try and assess in the history whether there has been a hemodynamic component or not. Fatigue is another symptom which may denote a cardiac disease. It's a very non-specific symptom. And ag again, differently patients will say, I get tired, and again, expressing in their local language. It's a common symptom, non-specific symptom. But if fatigue is present in patients known to having a cardiac disease, like ischemic heart disease or LBOT or RBOT obstruction, this is a sign which is of advanced uh, nature and this indicates that when the patient is exerting he is unable to increase the cardiac output further and that's why he is getting fatigued. It can also occur in patients with severe left main disease, severe left ventricular dysfunction, severe pulmonary hypertension. So fatigue is an important symptom. At times it can be non-specific. It's important to know. Now there can be cardiac disease manifesting through other systems. Hemoptysis, cough, we commonly see patients of heart disease coming with hemoptysis and hemoptysis can be due to pulmonary congestion, recurrent URI, pulmonary infarct, bronchopulmonary collateral rupture, abdominal symptoms because of heart failure and impaired brain function because of, again, because of uh, imbalance of the electrolytes. So these are the manifestations of heart failure but the symptoms are manifesting through other systems. Symptoms related to complications. A patient may have AF, he will come to you with palpitation. A patient of valve disease may not be complaining of any valve symptoms, but may come with fever because he has developed infective endocarditis. And a patient of heart disease may first present to you with congestive cardiac failure. Now, when you have assessed the history, there are four components which you should keep in mind what is the etiology, what is the anatomy or the pathological structural lesion, what is the physiological disturbance, and what is the functional class. Like we say in the exam, tell rheumatic heart disease, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, pulmonary hypertension, and VIH class 2 with or without atrial fibrillation. So you should come out with all the components. And etiological diagnosis, either you are, can be dealing with the rheumatic heart disease, congenital heart disease lumped together now as a structural, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, systemic hypertension, myocardial disease, pulmonary embolism, vascular disease. So you should talk about the etiology, physiology, whether the patient has CHF or not, whether there are any arrhythmias and atrial fibrillation being common and we are able to usually make it out clinically. Conduction abnormalities, bradyarrhythmias can be diagnosed clinically. And the format of clinical examination should be a systematic one. Look at the general appearance, whether there is cyanosis or no cyanosis, blood pressure, pulse, respiration, examination for CCF, then inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, and looking at other system. And you will be happy we will be talking to you about each and every. Now suppose you look at this patient, right from the general examination you can see 
there is a syndactyly and a polydactyly and this type of thing is common in patients who have a uh, single atrium ellis van creveld syndrome and if you see that patient has a cyanosis you are dealing with the cyanotic heart disease so a systemic approach to history taking and then going through a programmed approach about the examination can help you so thank you very much and i hope i have added to what uh, sir told and that should be our approach I think all of you should go through Brownwald's textbook of medicine, the latest one, uh, cardiology. Uh, how to, as he said, how to diagnose a classical pain of uh, angina or myocardial infarction. He has actually given several points on negative pr uh, predictability value and the positive predictability value. In that, he has given few points like pain on both the shoulders, pain at the back pain in the center of the chest, pain on walking, so give various points are given and then the ratios are given. So I think all of you should read that. Maybe some examiner who really goes through him, like what he has gone through, may ask you a question. What are the points on which you will predict that this is an anginal pain and a non anginal pain? So this new kind of a guideline on diagnosing an ischemic pain or anginal pain has been published. So I think if you go through the latest edition of Brown Wall's book, textbook of cardiology. The whole chart is given. I got it on my, but because of the paucity of time, I didn't show it to you. I think uh, today we are blessed with the one of the pioneers like uh, Palajani sir, Satyavan Sharma has given you very good insight about the history taking. And most of, as an examiner, I, kn I knew that in the long case, the, your page decides. And one, how you tell the history, how you narrate your history to the examiner. History taking is art, but presenting history to the examiner is also very important. So you have to add it certain points. You have, you, at the end of the long summary of the history, the examiner will ask you to summarize the point. So that time also you should be prepared because 40 minutes you will be given for case examination. So that time you should write down your points the relevant point, same thing is the negative history. If a uh, person is 65 years and you are uh, telling there is no history of recurrent RTI in the childhood, that is something not relevant. So you have to, unless you know the diagnosis, you drive the examiner to that point. So you should know what is important, negative history, relevant to that top, uh, case. Then it makes very interesting and then you can drive the examiner towards the, your examinations and other things. Mm -hmm. 
want any of the you to ask one or two questions so that uh, we also think that we are listening to the lecture seriously. Otherwise, we might feel that we have slept also. No questions? It's very clear. Excuse me. Uh, one yeah, please. Uh, sir, difference between syncope and TIA. Difference between syncope and TIA, they want. Say the transient ischemic attacks, usually uh, the in syncope, there will be a history that for temporarily the person has lost the loss of tone and has fallen down and has become unconscious and then has rapidly gained the consciousness. Whereas in transient ischemic attacks, there may be dizziness, there may be weakness, there may be blackness in front of the eyes, but the history of fall will not be there. History of loss of posture will not be. Thank you, sir. Uh, excuse me, sir. Sir, uh, sir, how do we take history uh, to differentiate whether it's a dyspnea on exertion or a fatigue on exertion while? Do you taking history? How do we extract that? Say, you know, as as I mentioned, you know, sometimes uh, to differentiate between dyspnea and fatigue also may become difficult. But dyspnea is mostly a expression which will tell that the patient is becoming aware of his own breathlessness, is will bec is becoming aware of uncomfortable breathing, whereas. Fatigue is whenever a person is trying to exert, he's unable to do, unable to walk, unable to this thing, and sometimes both fatigue and dyspnea may coexist. A patient becomes fatigued because he is dyspneic, or a patient may become dyspneic because he is fatigued. So sometimes the distinction may be different, but dyspnea mainly refers to the uncomfortable sensation of breathing, which can be expressed as whether you are expressing it a catch in the breath or difficulty in breathing or a stoppage of breathing. Whereas fatigue is mostly inability to walk, feeling weakness in the legs that I am not able to do any work. So that will be the differentiation between fatigue and dyspnea. And at times both can coexist. I differentiate in just one and two words. When you say dyspnea, I say it is lungs, and when you say fatigue, it is to the whole body. I think in simple terms, it is like this. Your symptoms are related to the lungs, you're not able to breathe. Fatigue is entire body. Another thing, uh, when I was at least a student, what used to intrigue is when you are uh, doing especially MD general medicine, a uh, cardiac professor used to write, uh, unstable angina admit. Now you used to see ECG used to be normal, patients used to be okay. And then uh, some funny reasons also used to be there in those times in the hospital. Just to make you laugh, I'm just telling you this. And uh, sometimes uh, some political leaders used to get admitted to the unstable angina. And some, something used to happen. So I was just worried, though, I was not understanding what is this unstable angina business in USA. Uh, so now chronic stable angina is different, unstable angina is different, no? So are you, do you anybody have any idea why is it called as unstable angina? What is this so, so unstable about it? Why did Ronald say it? Yeah, anybody can answer this? No? In this way also they might ask, you know, what is unstable angina? Why are you saying unstable angina? Yeah? You can answer in that mic. Uh, sir, uh, change is the intensity of the pain. So what it basically means is the definite particular pattern which was there, the pa patient was getting discomfort on the sequence of same work he was getting before. Suppose 100 steps he walks, or on flight steps he gets, used to get angina, it used to decrease. Now suddenly, because of some process which is happening inside the coronary arteries, either the pain should increase, increase could be with a less intensity exertionally is getting pain, or pain is happening more prolonged time, or is more severe. So it could be like a duration is lasting longer. So that means crescendo type of angina, that is increasing. Other thing is even at rest also it starts getting discomfort. So in, the interest, the why that is labeled like that is, uh, if you don't take care, then patient could get into myocardial infarction. Post-MI also sometimes post-MI angina is there, that means myocardium is not dead. 
So you should be uh, addressing that. That's the importance of becoming stable angina pattern into unstable. That's why it is labeled. And there are primary, secondary, all that I think you read in Brown World. So that is the reason why it is stated as unstable angina. Unstable angina can be with normal ECG, it can be with abnormal ECG. Nowadays we have now troponin elevation, now we say it is NSTME. But in those days, uh, I used to get uh, things sometimes this is normal, unstable, sometimes, but still, uh, the art of history taking becomes very important because everything could be normal, but patient could still have significant disease unless you talk to the patient properly, take proper history, you will miss out totally. Many times postprandial discomfort also is missed uh, and people think it is gas, gas and go home and suddenly they land in trouble. So all that is history taking is important. And how many of you read this uh, chronic coronary syndrome? The chronic unstable angina we used to, uh, stable angina we used to call. Now it is called as chronic coronary syndromes. I request all of you to go to that article, which shows that it is of six types and various things are described. So that also could be asked in exam, what is the latest uh, modification? Some of the latest things which are thought I just uh, add upon, you can go through those, right? And uh, now... Any other, uh, otherwise now we, uh, we uh, Shiva will take you to different dimension of artificial intelligence and other things happening in cardiology now. Any, uh, any, any doubts in these basics? As sir and madam said, expression of diagnosis is very important. So Satya Sharma showed clearly that slide, etiological diagnosis, sanitary.